Greetings, it's Bill Mobley for the Sanford Institute for Empathy and Compassion. Very pleased to be meeting today with Gary Firestein, who is the Associate uh, Vice Chancellor uh, for uh, Clinical and Translational Research at UCSD. He's also a dean and he's a professor of medicine. Um, Gary plays a very important role in the university, one that's incredibly vital. It's, it's how we move ideas to become clinically available to our patients. It's how we get basic science translated into clinical care. So Gary, welcome to the show. Uh, tell us about you. And, and uh, a lot of people know your name, but not everybody knows the Gary that I know. So go ahead and tell us about you, Gary. We'll start out with the university life. Um, I wear many hats at UCSD. Uh, some of them administrative, uh, some of them uh, clinical, and some of them uh, focused on research. Um, and the research side, I'm a uh, rheumatologist who studied rheum rheumatoid arthritis for, unfortunately now, for many decades, um, and have been involved with unraveling some of the mysteries of that disease, and have been very fortunate to participate in a lot of the studies that led to some of our new therapeutics um, that are so effective in our patients today. On the clinical side, I still see patients uh, in the clinic, a rheumatology clinic, uh, and teach our fellows and residents clinical rheumatology. And on the administrative side, um, I oversee the Altman Clinical and Translational Research Institute, as well as a variety of other offices that are involved with uh, uh, with uh, clinical research um, that's focused, obviously, on uh, human subjects. Um, in that capacity, the institute that we've developed over the last 10 years has grown from, um, I guess, me sitting in an office in the Biomedical Science Building on the fifth floor to a 360,000 square foot building that holds about 1,000 people uh, runs about 250 clinical research protocols a year uh, and is involved with almost every clinical trial that uh, is performed at, at UCSD. So that's, that is the, uh, that, that's the basic scope of my responsibilities here. If you were to ask me, what do I really love to do more than anything else, um, I like research and I like seeing my patients. Uh, I find that uh, the most rewarding. I, I think one of the things that I've learned over the years is that happiness does not come from individual um, accomplishments and that I have really learned that um, helping others to succeed is also an enormous, creates an enormous sense of satisfaction. And that's really what the administrative uh, roles are involved with. Um, most of the time when people aren't getting angry with me uh, for um, decisions that I may have to make, uh, particularly the um, inexperienced or new investigators uh, have access to resources and are able to perform research that they never could have performed in the past without the support of, uh, of our institute. So I actually do get great satisfaction from that. I think it's wonderful that you derive your energy from two things. First of all, your own work as a clinician and researcher, but also then this work as an administrator where you're supporting others. This is, this is a different kind of satisfaction, but it sounds like it's been very, very important for you. It, yes, and it's one that evolves over time. I would say in many early, for most, many early and mid-stage investigators, mid-career investigators, the primary focus is on individual accomplishment, getting papers written, getting grants, and so on. It's really over time that people evolve uh, and begin to take a, a larger view, an institutional um, role, and focus more on helping others to succeed. Now, there are, there are actually a lot of people that folk keep their focus on their own research over the years, and that, I think that's perfectly fine. I, and and they, uh, they get great satisfaction from that, and they make amazing contributions. Uh, but there is this subset of uh, people who uh, look to have a larger impact that's not focused on making specific 
research discoveries, but again, enabling the, uh, the work of others. You know, Gary, we've been talking about how the university is already a very dynamic place, but very recently, of course, because of the pandemic, we've had to pedal faster. We've had to find new ways to manage the stresses that have come with that. Speak a little bit about how you've been impacted by this pandemic and your work. Well, that again, that's on several uh, levels. From the perspective of helping others to succeed and helping our patients have access to novel therapies, um, it's been pretty disastrous. Uh, we The shutdown um, affected almost every aspect of uh, research uh, and has had an adverse impact on clinical trials. And clinical trials is how we bring some of these novel therapeutics to um, individuals that are not being adequately served by current standard of care or don't have access to them because they live or work in underserved areas. Um, so although clinical trials were still allowed to continue, there was concern and in some cases fear of exposure for our patients who were then reluctant to come in. And we have found that depending on the type of treatments that they were receiving and the type of medical problems they had, uh, the visits would decrease anywhere from about 10% to 75%, where people just would not come in. So we did have to adapt uh, to this new uh, uh, frightening world by having more what are called remote visits using telemedicine. Rather than asking people to come into the clinic to pick up their medicines, we, for the first time, started mailing medicines. And I, I know that sounds like a trivial thing, but there are huge regulatory burdens that are placed on clinical trials to make sure that a medicine that's experimental, when it's mailed, actually gets to the right person and is taken by the, by the correct person. So, uh, so we are um, gradually um, digging ourselves out of that uh, Research is now uh, gradually opening, uh, and we're happy about that. We, like everybody else, are concerned about the risks not only to the patients, but also to the staff, uh, and have taken extraordinary precautions uh, in order to try to make sure that everyone is protected. And of our screening programs so far, just to looking for asymptomatic people, it's been remarkable how few people are infected um, or, or are carriers of the virus. It's out of some 6,000 or so that we've screened, there have been just a handful. And I, I, and I, the, the, the joke I make is that it is higher risk going to Costco to buy toilet paper uh, than it is to come into the clinic where we are taking all of these, uh, all of these precautions. Um, we also, um, be, because there were so few studies going on, because there was this pressing need, we really reprioritized our efforts to try to collect samples from patients who had uh, um, COVID infection in an attempt to help other people's research. So we, uh, we put enormous uh, effort into getting um, all of the approvals required to do that create a biobank with these uh, samples, develop a governance structure, uh, and then begin distributing the samples to researchers so that they could be studying, uh, uh, either developing new um, diagnostic methods for, uh, for the disease or uh, determining um, you know, what are some of the weak links in this COVID virus that could potentially be, uh, uh, be attacked with, uh, with therapeutics. Uh, so um, that has been a huge effort, uh, and um, it's gone amazingly well. Uh, we have a fairly robust uh, clinical sample collection, thanks to the collaboration with uh, physicians and staff in the emergency department, in the ICUs, uh, and the hospital medicine division, and we're actually working to expand uh, even further. This is going to be and out a unique resource that will be available to, uh, to, to the researchers um, in the region. You know, we've heard so much in other interviews about how very adaptive the UCSD faculty have been. And it sounds like this is another example 
where people really working together for the good of others has been possible. So, so there are a number of investigators who have completely shifted their research priorities to understand and explore and, and turn their energies and, um, and expertise towards understanding COVID. Uh, and, and I think that goes across the board for genomics researchers, epidemiologists, all, all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of areas. And I think in the end, the payoff is not going to be, you know, in the next week or month. But over the course of the next couple of years, I think that this is going to have a major impact on how this particular virus and subsequent viruses, uh, you know, can be addressed. I think... Unfortunately, COVID um, is going to be around with us a long time, and uh, and as a result, we are also turning our attention towards prevention trials with vaccines and monoclonal antibodies and convalescent plasma, and the and the ACTRI has a number of protocols that are in the early stages of development that will hopefully be launched in the next month or so. So it's not just basic research in labs but also clinical investigators are really turning their attention towards uh, towards us. So, and in particular, some of the infrastructure set up for HIV is being um, leveraged in order to uh, adapt those studies for people who, uh, you know, for either COVID clinic therapeutic trials or vaccine trials and, and so on. Um, from, from my own research, it's essentially ground to a halt. Uh, um, you know, everything had a hard stop. Uh, we are basically just keeping our cells alive in the tissue culture, um, waiting to be allowed to go in and begin our work again. Um, it's interesting because, you know, the research is funded by grants, but the, the grants don't add more money in and they don't add more time at the back end in order to make up for this. And we, none of us have, have figured out how, you know, how this is going to all work out. Um, from a clinic perspective, uh, I, I've become more adept at uh, telemedicine. So I log on to uh, the electronic health record and I do the best I can in a teaching clinic uh, with video visits. It's a little hard in a specialty like rheumatology where physical examination is pretty important, um, but we do our best. Uh, and, you know, all of these things, as I said, I, are going to slowly loosen up over the course of the next couple of years. And I'm not, not a couple of years, but a couple of weeks, I should say. Sorry about that. Um, and during all this time, of course, I've been hunkered down in my secret bunker, which you can see behind me. Um, and it's been interesting for the last couple of months. And, and one of the things I've learned is that, which I think I knew before, is that most of my job I can do anywhere. I, I, a lot of what I do is electronic communication, um, tele, uh, you know, telephone calls, and now, of course, these video uh, calls, Zoom calls or Skype calls. Um, and those um, actually make it much easier to schedule meetings where in the past it was very difficult because everybody was spread all over the campus because we're all over the city. And now everybody's kind of used to this. The, the thing that it's missing, though, is the, are the subtle parts of meetings that are only established with direct contact, body movements, direct eye contact, um, uh, body language are all things that somehow get lost in translation. And I think that's particularly problematic um, in first meetings uh, where you don't know somebody. If you already know somebody very well, a lot of times you can pick up on this stuff, but Initial meetings um, or, uh, dare I say, contentious meetings are much more difficult to do uh, this way. I, and, and, and believe me, um, you know, all of us uh, in, the, in leadership positions have very contentious meetings uh, where there's disagreements and conflict. And it's easier to manage that uh, when people are sitting across from each other at a table than sitting across through ethernet cables or, or, or something like that. And I'm sure there's a neurobiology of this. It's interesting. We're gonna to have to innovate a new neurobiology that speaks to not loss of, lost in translation, but lost in transmission. You're right, person to person interactions, 
the subtle movements of the hand, the body, the way the head is held, the eye to eye contact, these are all very human social activities that are that are muted, if not lost, at least muted with the Zoom conference or the Skype meeting. So in terms of staying at home, it actually it's a pretty nice place and I can do most of what I want to do and I don't have to fight traffic. Uh, and uh, if I want to work out at 11 o'clock, I can work out at 11 o'clock and schedule my meetings around that. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility in there that uh, I kind of like, to be perfectly honest. So uh, when all of this is uh, over, um, I'm probably I'm going to end up with some sort of hybrid where I carve out times at home versus times, um, times in the office that's going to be structured somewhat differently from what I'm doing now. So, Gary, I was going to ask, so we've had to adjust to this uh, shelter in place and we have learned from it and we have adapted to it. Um, in the clinical trial in which I'm involved, uh, we now take this as an opportunity to adjust, to adapt, to innovate a little bit around how we do clinical trials. What, what thoughts do you have around, you know, the future of clinical trials and perhaps the use of the telemedicine approach? Well, we had been exploring with uh, telemedicine in the context of clinical research, not just clinical trials, but also research that's not based on therapeutics um, in distant areas. And we have quite a few individuals uh, who are research participants in Imperial Valley and other distant locations. And it's been extremely difficult to coordinate the research projects with those individuals. And oftentimes they would have to drive long distances. And, and so we had been exploring with telemedicine already. And this really uh, uh, opened the flood, the, the most recent events have opened the floodgates. Uh, we are now, um, we were required to do things remotely for a period of time. But I think uh, once uh, you know, once the door has been opened, you know, you, 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 you we're not going to go back to um, insisting that everybody be face to face with every meeting. So we're focusing more on electronic data capture, for example, so that people can fill out their surveys um, on their tablets or their computers at home. Um, we have challenges in underserved communities where Internet access is not quite so uh, readily available. And we're working on ways uh, to adapt to that by providing potentially central locations where people can go in order to in order to participate in research without having to drive two hours to you know to you know to UCSD. Um, so so I think those are the major uh, adaptations. Um, as I said, the the some of the psychological issues and particularly related to very justifiable fear of being exposed when participating in research uh, will still need to be addressed. And I think there collecting data will help. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that um, so few healthcare workers at UCSD have proven to be COVID positive um, the fact that uh, we have really no documented or uh, cases where people have come into the clinic um, and have uh, become infected, I think those are the sorts of things that really help to provide some reassurance. There's always going to be uncertainty, though. You know, we can't, we don't live in a risk-free world, um, and every individual is going to have to decide for themselves about the risk-benefit ratio of participating. Um, but I'm hoping that um, there will be the gradual realization that the risks afforded by research participation, with, particularly with some of these adaptations that we've made, screening people before they come into the clinic, having one-way tape on the hallways so that you don't have a lot of cross traffic, uh, the use of, of uh, the protective uh, equipment, um, all those things I think will for quite some time be embedded in the way we do uh, the way we do clinical research
I want to just let viewers know that Gary has a hidden talent. And we're going to call upon that talent right now because he's going to play for us his favorite instrument. Gary? Well, but before I do that, I would just say that there is a life outside of uh, of the hospital and and research that is very rich and fulfilling, and and uh, and and music is one of them. It is certainly not the only one. Uh, my my daughter is on the faculty at UCSD and is a hospital uh, medicine um, the caregiver, uh, and is uh, very pregnant, and so. We're busy trying to figure out how in the world of COVID that's all going to work. I just had my med school virtual reunion where the main one of the main topics was grandparents not being able to hug and touch their grandchildren. And and I think there's a lot of discussion now on the importance of parental bonding. And of course, my daughter and her husband, who also is on the faculty at UCSD, um, are are busy trying to work out how that's going to all um, happen uh, after the baby is born. But I don't know that we've given enough attention to how the, the importance of the extended family. And, and I think um, that may be something that we want to think about, uh, think about more uh, because when this is our first grandchild and I mean, we are thrilled and we'll do whatever we need to, to protect, the, the baby, but you know, at what, at what cost, uh, to, to that initial bonding experience? I, I just don't know. And, and then, as you said, I, I have lots of activities. I'm a, I have been for many decades, what I call an addicted surfer and have surfed all over the world. Um, unfortunately the ravages of osteoarthritis have caught up with me. And I, I like to say that I'm a semi-retired surfer, but it's actually quite difficult for me to do that. And, and as a result, several years ago, I took up a musical instrument, which was the banjo. It was sort of on my bucket list for unclear reasons. And I took lessons weekly for a couple of years and now have a small band, um, called Blue Room, R-H-E-U-M. It's kind of a, Rheumatology <laughs> joke. Good. <laughs> um, and uh, and in the last year, I started taking piano lessons. We, I have my grand. I inherited my grandfather's beautiful grand piano uh, many years ago, and it just sat in our house. And I thought, well, it's time to learn. And my wife um, Linda arranged for piano lessons, and so I'm learning how to play the piano. So aside from all this sort of doctoring and and research and administrative activities, um, there's, uh, there, you know, there's clearly a lot more to life than, um, than submitting grants and, 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 and billing through the electronic health record. Right, for sure. Great. Here it is. Beautiful banjo. Beautiful. Thank you. It's, I have a few of them. I have one in my office at, at work. And um, if I screw this up, please don't don't judge me. And uh, I thought I thought I would play Red River Valley, which is a song that everybody knows. Um, nice. And it begins off fairly simple, and then it becomes a little more complex as uh, as time goes on. And I don't know if you can. All right. Fantastic. And and it was such a powerful demonstration that the lights went back on in my room. So it's I, even I'm going to take complete responsibility for that. 
Gary, um, I, I want to finish off by saying thank you for doing this for us and with us. And even more, uh, thank you for being who you are and making such an important contribution to the leadership at UCSD and to the work that we do to take great science into great care. And uh, again, Gary, just thanks so much and best wishes to you and stay strong and stay healthy. Thank you very much. And thank you for your, also for your leadership with the new Institute and for this incredibly important aspect of, of, of health and healthcare uh, that you and your team are leading. You're welcome. Thanks. That's it for us. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, keep tuned in. We'll have other really exciting guests like Gary on future shows. Thank you so much.